uh, finding a parking space this morning and getting into the facility. Uh, we, we appreciate your patience with us in that effort, uh, but it is so good to have you with us on campus once again. Thank you as well to those who have joined by Zoom. We're mindful of you as well. And again, today we will be monitoring the Zoom chat room uh, for comments and questions. Just as we did last week, there will be uh, a time for question and answer, uh, but we want to make sure that we do that in a orderly fashion so everybody can be heard. So we'll give you some instructions about that as well. Um, before I introduce Dr. Stokes again and bring him up to continue his lecture series, I want to mention just a few things that we, we brought to your attention last week. Just want to remind you as we get started today, uh, Dr. Hummel spoke last week about the upcoming trip to Israel that's happening this summer. Uh, so the dates are June 22nd through July 2nd for the tour. And then after that, there will be a further excavation at Tel Akish. So uh, if you would be interested in joining uh, that group for the trip, we can get you more information about that. If you would be interested in helping to sponsor a student who would maybe like to go on the trip but is concerned about the financial requirements of that trip, um, that would be an amazing opportunity to bless a Tusculum student and give them a trip of a lifetime. So if you'd be interested in helping to, to support a student go, that's an opportunity as well. So any information you would like about the Israel trip, please let us know. Dr. Hummel will be leading the trip. Uh, he has a lot of experience and expertise in the field, and so I know it's going to be a blessing to those who participate. Uh, also, I want to mention the minister's luncheon that's coming up on March 2nd. If you are in the area and you are a um, pastor or staff at a, at a church, we would love to have a time of fellowship with you that day. We'll meet right in here in this room, so we're, we'll have food and, and just an opportunity to to get together and encourage one another and hear about how God is working in our community and in our churches. So I actually have a sign-up sheet with me today. Some of you have already emailed me an RSVP for the minister's lunch, but if you're a minister here today and you've not yet done so, but you'd like to sign up to attend, we've got the sign-up sheet right here and we would be happy to have you. Um, once again, as we said last week, um, we are able to provide these amazing lectures at no cost through donations. And so if you would like to be a part of making sure that the Theologian in Residence Lecture Series continues into the future, uh, we would appreciate your support and your donations to help make that happen. Uh, we do have some uh, pledge envelopes and pledge cards available out here at the table. Uh, if you would like to give specifically to Theologian in Residence, you can mark that. If you'd like to give for the Israel trip, you can mention that as well. If you would like to give uh, just more broadly to campus ministries here at Tuscaloosa and support the work that we're trying to do in edifying our students spiritually, you can do that. If you have any questions about these things, please don't hesitate to let me know. Uh, we want to we want to partner in this together, and we certainly do appreciate each and every one of you and your support of all that's happening here at Tuscaloosa. Well, once again today, we welcome Dr. Ryan Stokes. As we said last week, he is the Director of Graduate Theological Studies at Carson Newman University, as well as Associate Professor of Biblical Studies. His book, The Satan, How God's Executioner Became the Enemy, was published in 2019. Uh, several of you have asked about getting copies of the book. He hopes to have some with him next week. So uh, he said he plans to have about 20 copies next week. So we'll see how quickly they go. <laughs> uh, but I know several of you have asked, so he's going to try to provide those. Uh, and we appreciate him once again being with us. So let me say just a word of prayer, and then we will have the first hour of lecture and presentation. Just as we did last week, we'll take a break about 11 o'clock and then continue on through noon when we're dismissed for lunch. But thank you once again for being here. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful for this day, for this opportunity to learn, to study your word together, and to think about these things that are so important. We thank you for Dr. Stokes. We know he has worked hard to come to an understanding of these things, and we are so appreciative of him sharing that wisdom with us today. And we ask that you would help us to all uh, do as your word says, to love you with all of our minds, to think well about these things, to think in a way that honors you and that honors your word. Thank you for this beautiful facility, this campus, and this university where we can come together for such special events like this and these cherished traditions. Um, we give you this time and we ask that 
you would use it for our good, but ultimately for your glory. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's welcome Dr. Stokes once again. No. How about now? There we go. There we go. All right. I wouldn't want y'all to miss out on information about Satan. So, how was your week? Good week. Good week. Good week is really good to see y'all again. Thanks for coming back. And uh, I'm excited to, to be here with you. I thought I would tell you, uh, begin today, just telling you a little bit about myself. Uh, you've heard kind of my, my story professionally, but I thought I would go back to the beginning to talk about the origins, not of Satan, but of Brian Stokes. Uh, and and uh, any Kentucky people here? I grew up in Bowling Green, Kentucky. So we had a few. You can tell, all right, good, good, good. Are you allowed to wear blue in Tennessee? Or do you have to wear blue? <laughs> No, I, I'm thinking. You say neutral, but orange and blue probably don't mix together well. Uh, but, uh, but oh, that's that. There is the core. I forgot about the core. But uh, yeah, I, I grew up in Bowling Green, Kentucky, which is uh, the place where Corvettes are manufactured. Uh, any Corvette fans here? Some Corvette fans up there? Uh, Bowling Green, Kentucky is also the headquarters of Fruit of the Loom. <laughs> I, I shared this at the beginning of a sermon at a church one time, and people applauded when I mentioned Corvette or some Corvette fans there, apparently. Then I mentioned the, the underwear, and I got an even bigger applause. <laughs> Pastors, when you're, church, when you're out of town, you never know how your congregation is behaving. Uh, but, uh, so, so I grew up in Bowling Green, Kentucky. I, I, I was blessed to, to grow up in a home uh, with two parents who were both believers. Uh, my father and mother, they, they grew up on adjacent farms in western Kentucky, and, and they met one day when my father hopped the fence and walked across my mother's farm to buy a watermelon uh, from my mother's father. They were 17, she was 17, and he was 19 uh, when they got married. What's interesting, though, is that uh, my mother's family was Baptist and Republican, very Republican, as a matter of fact. My father's family was Methodist and Democrat. <laughs> so when they got married, this, this, this is funny, but it's not this is exactly what happened. My, my father, they, they made a deal when they got married that my, my dad would join the Baptist church if my mother would register to vote as a Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, that was the deal that they made. So I'm kind of a product of a, of a sort of mixed marriage. Uh, <laughs> I have some other family stories I can tell you where our marriages weren't as mixed as they should have been, uh, but, uh, but I was a product of, of a bit of a, yeah, some of you know what I'm talking about. That's definitely a story for another time. Uh, but uh, today we're talking about mixed marriages, or at least that's where we are going to start with Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Uh, when the people began to multiply on the face of the ground and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that they were fair and they took wives for themselves of all that they chose. Uh, then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in mortals forever, for they are flesh, their days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards. When the sons of God went into the daughters of humans and bore children to them, these were the heroes that were of old, warriors of renown. Now, I remember the first time I noticed this uh, this passage. Uh, I've read it before, uh, but I think I was in college the first time I read this passage, and, and it kind of dawned on me what it seemed to be saying. Uh, is this passage really talking about <coughs> angels or some sort of heavenly being having, uh, having marriages with human women and having children with them? That seems so strange to me, very, very bizarre. Uh, but that's uh, that's kind of what it seemed to say uh, on an initial read, or at least initial read in which I was paying attention. Uh, there are actually uh, a few different possible interpretations of this passage. Uh, let's see if we can bring those up. Three interpretations. The first one is the one that I just mentioned. Uh, the sons of God are superhuman beings. Now, I'm saying superhuman beings rather than angels because I'm 
a professor nerd, and I'm being really careful about what I'm saying, but the, in the, the Old Testament, we often look at all of these beings, cherubs and seraphs, sons of God, and we, we call them all angels. I'm not sure that they would have done this in ancient Israel. Uh, so I'm saying superhuman beings because they're, they're called sons of God in this passage. And so we're just going to say superhuman beings rather than assuming that these are angels. Uh, but the first interpretation, uh, the sons of God are superhuman beings. Uh, a second interpretation, a uh, second possibility uh, with respect to understanding who these sons of God are, uh, is that these sons of God are the descendants of Seth. Now, you may recall uh, Adam and Eve, the first human couple, they had two sons, Cain and Abel. The older son, Cain, <coughs> murdered his younger brother, Abel. Uh, after Abel had been murdered, Adam and Eve had a third son whose name is Seth. And in Genesis uh, chapters 4 through 5, we get genealogies uh, of Cain and genealogies of, of Seth, or genealogies coming from Cain and Seth, and we, we learn about their descendants. And so one possibility is that the sons of God here are the descendants of, uh, well, the sons of God are the descendants of Cain, and this is like a godly line, a chosen line, so to speak, uh, and the daughters of men, or the daughters of humans, those are the descendants of Cain, who are not godly. So that's that interpretation. So the sons of God marry the daughters of men. That's not about angels or superhuman beings marrying human women. It's about two different families of, of humans intermarrying, the family of Cain and the family of uh, Seth. Third interpretation that has been proposed uh, is that the sons of God are human rulers. In the ancient world, uh, often the language of divinity or, or the language of divine sonship would be used to refer to kings. Uh, maybe you are familiar with, uh, with 2 Samuel 7, where God makes a promise to David uh, that after David is, is, has died, that God's going to raise up a son to sit on David's throne, and what God says is that I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. So even in the Old Testament, you have this language of divine sonship, someone being a son of God if they're, they're a king. And so that's another interpretation here. Maybe these are kings or royal figures who are intermarrying with, with common women or, or something like that. I'm not sure uh, what the, what the um, daughters of men would be in that interpretation. But let me talk about these just a little bit, one at a time. Whoops, I, I gave it away. Okay, good. <laughs> First of all, uh, this, is, this is not supported by Genesis. This, this, uh, this interpretation is simply not, it, Genesis does not suggest that all of, Seth, or all of Seth's descendants are godly and all of Cain's descendants are, are wicked. There, there's nothing of that sort suggested in Genesis. So this, this interpretation really doesn't have any support. Um, human rulers, this one doesn't really work well either, although we do have a couple of places in the Old Testament where a king is said to be God's son, the plural sons of God, like we have in Genesis 6. That does not refer to kings. That refers to, to divine or, or superhuman beings in the passages where that occurs. Um, so these two interpretations really don't work. What I'm going to try to present to you today is that the evidence is, is very clear in favoring the superhuman being interpretation. If these are, in fact, divine beings. Uh, angels, perhaps, would be one way to refer to them. Uh, but these divine beings uh, who marry human women and have children with them, which is really weird. That's, that's very strange. But that does seem to be what's going on here. As a matter of fact, I think the reason that some interpreters have proposed one of these other interpretations is, is because this does seem very strange. Nevertheless, uh, this does seem to be the, the way that this passage was intended by the author uh, of Genesis. So that's the interpretation we're going to look at today. And let me give you seven arguments in favor of this interpretation. First of all, and I've already uh, mentioned this or suggested this, 
The expression of sons of God, it occurs in Genesis 6, and it occurs in five other places in the Old Testament. <laughs> in every one of these passages, the expression sons of God refers unambiguously to superhuman beings. In every single one of them, some of you may be familiar with Job 1 and 2, where, where you have a day that the sons of God gather together before God and Satan is there as well. We'll talk about that passage. Uh, well, we've already talked about it. We may talk about it again. Uh, but, but, but there you have an example of sons of God, clearly superhuman beings. Uh, everywhere outside of this passage, that the expression occurs. Then we have related expressions as well uh, that are similar to this, though not identical. And they also refer to divine beings. Psalm 82, for instance, refers to sons of the Most High. And these are divine beings as well. Uh, one, and, and those of you who've been to seminary may have learned this, uh, but one important interpretive principle is if you come across a word or an expression that, that's ambiguous in the context that you're studying, if you look elsewhere in the Bible or elsewhere in the, in the same testament, especially. Uh, to see where else that word or expression occurs, that's one way to figure out what it means. So when we do that here, we come across the expression "son of God," and maybe there's some confusion or some some ambiguity about it. But when we look elsewhere in the Bible, and every single time it refers unambiguously to divine beings of some sort, that that suggests very strongly that that's what it means here as well. Now, in my mind, that's enough. To conclude that that's what this passage is talking about, but I'm going to give you six more arguments because um, that, that's what I do. That's, 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 what, that's what I get paid for. So. Okay, the expression "daughters of man." To my knowledge, this expression doesn't occur anywhere else in the Old Testament, but we do have an expression that's very similar to it. The expression "son of man" uh, occurs in Ezekiel and in Daniel, and the expression "son of man," where that occurs, it refers to a human being or a human male, uh, more specifically. And so the implication of, of this would be that a daughter of man would also be uh, a human being and, and a human woman. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you look in verse 1 um, of chapter 6, it has the same words. When people began to multiply on the face of the ground and daughters were born to them, the word people here is the same word that's translated as man and daughters of man. It's Adam. Uh, and then you have daughters here. So you have the word human, you have the word daughter used within just a few verses uh, of, of this, well, in this very passage, within just, within just a few verses of the, the, the expression daughters of man. And in, in that passage, they're really referring to human beings and, and the daughters that are being born to them. So, so there's really not a plausible interpretation of this exception except for, for it referring to the human women. So if we take those and put them together, what we see are two parallel expressions. We have sons of God bearing daughters of man, where sons and daughters are, are supposed to be uh, contrasted with each other, and God and man are supposed to be contrasted with each other. And the question that I have is, if you have these two expressions together where sons and daughters are kind of, that makes sense. There, there are males who are marrying females. Then you have God and man, which seems to be divine and human. I'm not sure that this pair of expressions could be expected to, to contrast anything else except for superhuman males marrying superhuman or marrying human females. If we were to go to the other interpretation, like the, the sons of Seth uh, and the daughters of Cain, why would it be that only the male descendants of Seth? Marry the female descendants of Cain rather than the other way around. Uh, that doesn't quite make sense. But if you're thinking of, of divine superhuman males marrying human women, that makes a little more sense to explain why the relationship is just one way. You don't have daughters of God marrying sons of man, um, for instance. All right. Argument. Yes, sir. Do you give any weight to the Sumerian history and uh, hold that question, and, and at the end of the, the time, maybe we'll have time for that. But thank you. Uh, number four, impressive offspring. One of the things that this passage mentions is the fact that children are born in these marriages. Now, if this is just a regular marriage, then, then so what? 
Uh, that's what marriages often produce are our children, right? Maybe I'll tell you stories about my children another time. Uh, but uh, that doesn't seem to be a very significant piece of, of information. However, if these marriages are a hybrid marriage between divine beings and human beings, and all of a sudden it is significant that children are born to these marriages. And then explain why you have why you have these heroes of renown, these warriors of since the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward. Uh, Nephilim probably means something like fallen ones, uh, likely these, these great warriors who have fallen in battle. So the Nephilim are not the sons of God, they're different. Uh, but these are our warriors who fall in battle. They were on the earth in those days also afterward when the sons of God went into the daughters of humans who bore children to them. These were the heroes that were bold warriors of renown. So, so the probably the most straightforward way of reading this text is that the Nephilim are the children that are born to these marriages. And these are these great warriors that are remembered um, in, in the stories of, of ancient Israel. This leads me to number five, the ancient theological context of this passage. One of the biggest barriers to interpreters uh, in accepting this interpretation is, is, like I said, it just seems strange to think of angels or, or some other sort of divine being having children with, with human women. Um, however, if we put ourselves in the minds of the ancient author and ancient readers, of Genesis, this story isn't quite so strange. This is precisely the kind of story that ancient people were, were telling, things that they were writing about and, and reading about. So you may know of uh, stories about someone named Hercules. Uh, this is the Marvel Comics version of Hercules. Uh, I don't know what the actor's name is. Uh, Perseus, uh, you know, has a divine have a has a divine father and a human mother. Uh, Gilgamesh from the ancient Near East. Those are those are Greek Greek myths. Uh, and and uh, Gilgamesh in the, the the Near East, he was two thirds divine. Now I'm not sure how that happened, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but he was two thirds uh, divine. So this makes a whole lot of sense. Now, I'm not saying that Genesis 6 is about Hercules or that Genesis 6 is about Gilgamesh or, or Percy, any of these, but simply that this is, these are the kinds of stories. In the ancient world, this was the kind of story that people considered plausible, uh, considered to be helpful. And it's not, it wouldn't be surprising to find this kind of story uh, in the Old Testament. As, as strange as it may seem to us in our 21st century Western mindset. All right. This is the earliest known interpretation of this passage. So the, the idea that Genesis 6 verses 1 through 4 refers to divine beings marrying human women, this is the earliest interpretation that we have. Uh, the text I'm referring to here is is First Enoch, or actually a segment of First Enoch, uh, called the Book of the Watchers, that dates to around the third century BC. So, so 250 to 300 years before the time of Christ, people were reading Genesis, and they were reading Genesis six, and, and finding in that story uh, a, a a story about angels who who sinned uh, by rebelling. Uh, against God and marrying human women. Let me read to you a, an excerpt. Uh, this is First Enoch six verse nine. Now let me go back. The Book of Enoch is not in the Bible, so so it's not in. Unless you're a member of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, uh, it is not in your Bibles. Uh, so this is this isn't one of the apocryphal uh, books that you you might have if you go to a Roman Catholic Church um, or do a canonical uh, book. Uh, so, so for the large majority of, of Christian tradition, this is not part of the Bible for them, but it is a book that was written, roughly speaking, between the Old and New Testament, you know, a few hundred years before the time of Christ, and, uh, and, and it was a book that was very widely circulated and very popular at this time, uh, and used and read by Jews. Uh, here's what it says in chapter 6, when the sons of men had multiplied in those days, beautiful and comely daughters were born to them. And the watchers, the sons of heaven, saw them, 
and desired them. So the sons of God here, they call them sons of heaven and watchers. And we actually have the, the word watcher at one place in the Bible. Anyone know where we have a watcher in the Bible? Close. Close. In, in Daniel, the book of Daniel, uh, we have a watcher mentioned, and let me, I'm going to get to the right. I'm going to say chapter four of Daniel. Um, story of Nebuchadnezzar going crazy for, for several years. Uh, and there's a watcher that decrees that this is going to happen. So you have an angelic being called watchers. Sons of heaven. Uh, they saw the, the daughters of men and desired them. And they said to one another, come, let us choose for ourselves wives from among the daughters of men and let us beget children for ourselves. At this point, you get a nice long list. I'm not going to read it to you. A list of, of about 20 watchers and their names. Uh, we'll come across one of the names. It says, these and all the others with them took for themselves wives from among them such as they chose, and they began to go into them and to defile themselves through them and to teach them sorcery and charms and to reveal to them the cutting of roots and plants, and they conceived from them and bore them great giants. Now, the book of Watchers here, the book of Watchers, is clearly supplementing uh, the story in comparison to what we have in Genesis. Genesis doesn't even say that this is bad. I mean, maybe it implies that, but Genesis doesn't say it was wrong for these sons of God to marry a few women, uh, at least not explicitly. In, in the book of Watchers, this is definitely a sin, uh, and it's one among several sins. Not only was it a sin for these watchers to engage in sexual activities with, with human women, but they also teach humans how to engage in a number of illicit practices, such as divination and sorcery. Uh, it goes on to say that the, that the watchers teach humans how to make weapons and, uh, and uh, armor and that they would use to, to, to fight one another. Uh, the watchers, according to the story, also teach people how to make jewelry and cosmetics, which according to the story leads to sexual immorality. So if you're wearing makeup today or jewelry, then, then the Book of Watchers is not approved. Uh, of that. That, you may not be able to realize this, but, but sinful angels taught us how to do that, at least according to, to this story here. Um, Oh, and they have giants. I almost forgot to mention their kids are really big. <laughs> what does God do about it? Then the Most High declared, and the great Holy One spoke, and he sent Sariel, the son of Lamech. That's, the son of Lamech is Noah. Uh, he sent the angel Sariel to the son of Lamech, saying, Go to Noah and say to him in my name, Hide yourself, and reveal to him that the end is coming, that the whole earth will perish, and tell him that a deluge is about to come on the whole earth to destroy everything on the earth. So the flood, at least in part, according to the Book of Watchers, is sent in response to all of the evil that were being perpetrated on the earth by these things. By the way, if if you were to ask an ancient Jew uh, where evil came from, if, if someone were to ask you where evil came from, you would probably say, well, it's Genesis 3, it was just sit. Nice. <laughs> Seriously, I, I had to turn my phone off because every time I would talk about Assyria, or Syria, Syria would say, I don't understand what you're saying. Uh, I'm likely to activate some of your phones today. <laughs> but, uh, so uh, if you were asking early, like, where, where did evil come from? Well, if I asked you that, you could probably say Genesis 3, uh, Adam and Eve taking the fruit that God told them not to eat. If you ask an early Jew that, they're more likely to give you a couple of other answers. Uh, some Jews would say it came from Genesis 1. God created evil. Some Jews would say that. Uh, some ancient Jews at this time, they would say, well, it's not from Genesis 1 or Genesis 3, it's actually from Genesis 6. Evil came from these divine beings who came down and married human women and taught humans how to do all kinds of really wicked things. Uh, and so this was a really popular story in early Judaism, and it was used by some Jews to explain where certain evils in the world came from. Uh, God's response in uh, First Enoch is to send flood. And to Michael. If you've heard of Michael, he, he appears in, in the book of Revelation. Oh, you know, uh, Is it back now? Yeah. All right. Tell me if it goes off again. So Michael, we come across Michael in the book of Daniel. We come across Michael in the book of Revelation. 
June visions Michael as well, maybe somewhere else. I can't remember. Uh, but in, the, in those places. Uh, but, but here we have Michael and some of this literature that's, that's outside of um, the canon. <laughs> and the Michael got to uh, go again. <laughs> All right, I bet we have some batteries by the way. You just use that mic as long as you get some batteries. Great. Great. Hold oh, oh, the trigger. Can you hear me when I'm talking to you? All right. Can you raise your hand if you can hear me on Zoom. <laughs> we got confirmation. All right. There you go. Uh, so, okay, I think I was reading the passage. And the Michael God said, Go, Michael, buy him Shimmy Hatsa. That was one of the fallen angels who came down and had children and taught them and bad stuff. Uh, and the others with him, uh, so go buy him Shimmy Hatsa and the others with him who made it with the daughters of men so that they were defiled by them in their uncleanness. And when their sons perish and they see the destruction of their beloved ones, bind them for 70 generations in the valleys of the earth until the day of their judgment and consummation, until the everlasting judgment is consummated so god sends a flood to wipe out all of the sinful human beings uh who'd learned the watcher's teaching uh god sends michael to bind the watcher to bind these sons of god to imprison them until the time of the judgment this was a very very popular story a very very popular interpretation of genesis 6. Uh, in early Judaism, we come across it in another book, second century BC, uh, Book of Jubilees. By the way, I think we'll talk about the Book of Jubilees next time as well, because Jubilees has a lot to say about Satan. Uh, but uh, let's look at the what the Book of Jubilees here says about this story. When humanity began to multiply the surface of the entire earth, and daughters were born uh, to them, there's a title there, born to them, uh, the angels of the Lord. In a certain year of this jubilee, saw that they were beautiful to look at, so they married them, uh, or so they married of them whomever they chose. They gave birth to children for them, and they were were giants. So there's another text, and there are others as well uh, that interpret the passage this way. This is the earliest known interpretation of Genesis six. Now remember exactly what that interpretation is, because we're going to come across it again in just a moment. So not only is this the earliest known interpretation of the passage that was very widespread and popular in Judaism, but this is the way the New Testament interprets this passage. So for those of us who are, are our Christians and look to the New Testament and Old Testament as, as our guide, uh, yeah, I think it's significant that the, the New Testament also uh, interprets the passage this way. So let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, Jude 6, and the angels who did not keep their own position, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains and deepest darkness for the judgment of the great day. Sounds a lot like that watcher story, doesn't it? These angels who left heaven and did what they weren't supposed to do, and, and God has bound them, uh, imprisoned them until the day uh, of the judgment. Oh, this is extra. I won't charge it for this. Uh, this is extra here. Uh, Jude actually quotes the Book of Enoch, the book we were reading a second ago. He actually quotes from it. Uh, he says it was also about these that Enoch and the seventh generations from Adam prophesied, saying, See, the Lord is coming with ten thousands of his holy ones. And the, the quotation continues, but, but Jude actually quotes from the Book of Enoch and, and, and uh, credits Enoch with the quotation. Think about that while it changes better. <laughs> All right. Hey, there we go. There we go. All right. So, so if you want to interpret Genesis this way. Uh, Second Peter also interprets Genesis this way. Uh, For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of deepest darkness to be kept until the judgment. And if he did not spare the ancient world, even though he saved Noah, herald of righteousness, with seven others, and he brought the flood on a world of the ungodly. Then he goes on to say that in the same way now, God knows how to, to take care of the righteous and, and make sure that the wicked are, are punished, at least eventually. Uh, but here we have an example of God punishing the angels, actually imprisoning them 
until the day of, of judgment. And he mentions Noah and the flood right after that, because these stories occur one after the other in uh, Genesis. Uh, another passage. For Christ also, so I was talking with my pastor about this passage the other day, um, and, and he's going to interpret it the way I do eventually. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> some of you may know him, so I, I'm, I'm going to stop talking right there. Uh, so, for Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, which I believe is talking about the resurrection, but being spiritually raised. Not that he wasn't bodily raised, but it's a different sort of spiritual body. Uh, in, in which he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who, who in former days did not obey when God waited patiently in the days of Noah. So who are the spirits who sinned back in the days of Noah and were in prison? Those are the sons of God. Yeah. So this is how they, and there's actually another passage in the New Testament that I'm not going to mention that's a little more complicated. But these passages, I think, are pretty clear uh, in interpreting Genesis 6, the way, or at least a similar way to the way that um, First Enoch, Jubilees, and other early Jewish texts do. Uh, seven arguments. Uh, for me, the, the, the one that really uh, persuades me, I mean, there, there are several here that I think persuasive, but, but just the fact that the expression sons of God is heard several times in the Old Testament, it always refers to divine beings. Uh, that, that's hard to deny the significance of that. Uh, but then you see the other six arguments, the meaning of the, the expressions daughters of man, the uh, comparison of or contrast of the sons of God, the daughters of man, their offspring, the ancient theological context, the earliest interpretation of the passage, and the New Testament's interpretation of the passage. I don't know how we're doing on time. Is it a good time to stop and have questions? I don't have any questions you want. <laughs> How was that? We got I was gonna say we've got about twenty minutes till eleven. Oh, okay, so so oh, let's, let's let's go for some questions. That's fine. And if we if we end up breaking a little early and then come back, we can we can play it by ear. Yes, ma'am. That's a great question. Um, Genesis does not say. Uh, it doesn't imply that that it was. Consensual or that it was not consensual, this it simply doesn't, doesn't say. Now, the Jewish text interpreted this in, in different ways. Uh, I don't think in any of them did they make it sound like the daughters were unwilling. There's some, and, and you can, this is kind of what you would expect that some ancient texts, uh, that there's one passage in another part of 1st Enoch that kind of blames it on the women. That they 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 learn how to make jewelry and cosmetics and they seduce the angels. So so that's what you're more likely to find in the ancient literature than the women not having a choice. Um, but Genesis itself doesn't say; it just says that sons of God marry human women. There's no no implication of it being consensual or, or not consensual. <laughs> Right, right. Yeah, and I don't know if we can look at any of the other ancient texts for guidance. Uh, so, by the way, the question for those of you on Zoom was, was, was the uh, the marriage consensual or not, or did the women have a choice? Uh, and I suppose we could look at other stories of, of Greek mythology and see how they were thinking of it, but ultimately Genesis doesn't, doesn't say, I don't think. Yes, sir? Uh, Jesus said in Luke 17 that the last days would be characterized by the, what happened during the days of Noah. And I would say today with all that's going on, with the sexual whatever, no sex or, and, or what sex, that it could be happening today, what happened back then with, you know, these fallen angels getting in with the people, you, know, you had to watch the Grammys just to see how terrible it's getting. And I, I think that that uh, Satan is back doing what he did in the days of Noah. That's one thing that you hear over and over in the Bible and in early Jewish literature is that uh, that the, the end days would be kind of like the beginning of time as well. And, and actually, the message of First Enoch is that just like God punished evil at that time, so God is going to do that at the end of time. So, so what you're saying, I think that the the authors of First Enoch would have loved it. <laughs> And we were in here in the back. Yeah, do your studies um, try to create a uh, who's who in this uh, uh, 
colony of heaven, so to speak. I mean, who? I mean, who's up there and who's not? Is this? Is it? Do your studies go there, or is this something that would be ancient Jewish or? It, different texts explain it. So, so the question is, is, is there any way to kind of, I'm going to paraphrase, kind of map out who these different beings are and what they do and the hierarchy is, <coughs> and understanding the correct Something like that. So uh, who, I think you said a who's who. I'm just saying, I'm thinking of Roman and Greek mythology. Mm -hmm. Is there a parallel, you know, names and faces? And, Things to do and, th and who they are. I don't think that the New Testament gives or, or the Old Testament give any parallels. Now, if you go to some of the like the later Christian literature, there's some Manichaean literature, this kind of Christian-ish group. Uh, a few centuries later, you, you start connecting some of the fallen angels or the giants with some of the like Gilgamesh and some other ancient Near Eastern characters. Uh, but we don't find anything like that at all in the Bible. So, so, so the question I think, if I understand it now, has to do with. Can we connect any of these characters that are talked about here with other stories that we know about? Um, and, and I don't think that the Bible uh, gives us enough information to, to make those sorts of connections. Yes, ma'am. Now, when I hear the word sons of God, I assume that they are good. So when you say they did these things, you know, were they good? What happened to make them bad? Or Yes. So, so sons of God sounds like a good expression. When we come to the New Testament, it says that, that Christians are, are the children of God, right, or sons of God. Of course, we know that Jesus is called the son of God. And so we have this expression used in a positive way uh, in other texts. Uh, and this expression, one of the things that, that we need to keep in mind when we read the Bible is it can use the same word and the same expressions in different ways. Uh, and so if we were to expand our search and look at the way the expression sons of God is used elsewhere in the New Testament and then maybe literature of the early church, we're going to get some different options, I think. Uh, but in the era in which Genesis was written, so in, in more of an Old Testament period, sons of God was more of a neutral term. These were, were divine beings, uh, and, and it, it wasn't a statement of whether they were good or bad. They, they worked for God, uh, but, but at least in this case, they, they kind of stepped out of line. Uh, at least according to Jewish publication. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, concerning the difference that you're talking about, I understand how ascendance of Cain was not as godly as you say it, you know. I, but uh, the difference there, uh, I pick up some question. I, I think he's still asking it. I'll, I'll, I'll repeat it just a moment. Thank you. Where, you know, he's had a conversation right with God and says, When I consider your heavens, the world, the fingers, the moon, the stars, what is man that you are mindful of? The son of man that you visit. You have made him a little lower. The real Hebrew word is Elohim, which is God himself. And then I think it's Hebrew. Or New Testament says, do you not know that you will judge the angels? And so I know that Moses and Noah and Enoch and if ones was a little bit more set apart that they honored God more than the majority of folks, even Abraham. And so I'm picturing that when they talk about the Son of Man, or Son of God, in all humans that were originally made in the image of likeness of Creator himself. Okay, let's see if I can summarize your question from the song. Song. I mean, uh, so when you hear the expression Son of God or Sons of God, you you were inclined to interpret that as human beings who are mankind that he originally created. A man kind of here, and who are the daughters of man in that case? Well, I mean, it's like what you said, you know, when man and woman get together, you want to have all the brains that we call this soul, okay. just at 1.6. But, you know, you got men that honor God more and, you know, make it more to the south. Okay. But the overall human. <coughs> Was literally created a little more than LLB. 
Sure. Okay. Okay. I think I understand now. You're going kind of with the 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 Seth. You made a case for the Seth versus Cain interpretation, where where all humans are created in God's image, uh, and and we're all sons of God to some extent, but but especially those who are living more the way God wants them to live. So so you're reading this as godly humans marrying ungodly humans. That is a possibility, yes. And that, that's the way some people. Mankind in general created this world. Very good. Yeah. So, so you don't have to agree with me. I'm not going to impose on you that you agree with me. You can you can continue to to interpret. I, I tell my students that they have the right to be wrong. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you certainly. But I actually talk about this with students. And the three points, and I don't, I, I don't give this lecture to, to. I give it. It's a little different when I give it to my college students. Uh, but this, the main points I make, I, I don't say that this passage is 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 important that they interpret it the way that I do. I mean, very few of you, if you if you change your interpretation of this because of the lecture, you're not going to have to go revise your your statement of faith for your churches or or anything like that, or or withdraw from your denomination or or anything uh, like that. This isn't a major theological issue. The reason that I think it's, it's helpful for students to look at this, though, is because of what we can learn about interpretation uh, from this passage. Uh, one thing I think we can learn is, is when you come across an ambiguous expression, you can look elsewhere in, in the Bible to see how that expression is used. Uh, another thing that I, 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 I stress to students is just because things may seem strange to us doesn't mean uh, that it would have been strange in, in ancient times. And that's important to keep in mind the cultural distance between us and the Bible. And that goes, well, the third thing which relates to this that, that I stress to, to students is that one really important characteristic of good biblical interpretation is simply an openness to the Bible saying something that seems weird to us. Uh, if we're expecting the Bible to tell us things that, that we would tend to agree with anyway, then I think we're going to misinterpret it in some places. And if we're open to the Bible saying something that's strange, then we're in a better position to see what it's actually saying. And, and I explain this both historically and theologically. We're talking about a text written in a place far different from our own, in a time far different from our own, in a culture very different from our own. And we should expect it to have some things. There's standards uh, of what is to be expected and what is strange where we're different from our own. Uh, and so we should expect it from a historical standpoint to have some things that are different. Also, from a standpoint of revelation, and, and I, at, at Carson Newman, it's Christian University, so I can talk about the Bible's revelation uh, there as well. If, if the Bible is divine revelation, as I believe that it is, then wouldn't that seem to suggest to me that God is going to tell us some things that we wouldn't have figured out on our own? And, and whether, whether it's something about angels that we wouldn't have expected, whether it's something about God's nature that we wouldn't expect. I mean, I, I didn't see the Trinity coming. Uh, that's, 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 uh, or or, or Jesus' is deep. That, that's hard for me to wrap my head around, but the Bible talks about it. Uh, ethics, love your neighbor as yourself, pray for your enemies. That's not something that I would have made up myself. Uh, and so if we're, we're going to understand the Bible correctly and apply it correctly, part of that is simply being willing to say, you know what? That's not what I would have guessed on my own, but that's what it says. Good answer. Good answer. Uh, thanks, thanks, thanks. <laughs> you taking a love offering? Uh, <laughs> yeah. I love your, love your presentation. Uh, a couple of thoughts. Um, the, the whole chapter five of Genesis is the genealogy of, of Seth, basically, and that messianic line. Um, and the other thing from Ephesians 6 that says our battle is not against flesh and blood. You know, and he mentions principalities and powers and all these things make us think about spiritual beings. But then, I, so I, I'm just back and forth all the time with the Bible because it, it's not one clear picture to me. Uh, so you go, go to um, Lot and, and Sodom and God sending the angels to rescue them. So, you know, so angels talk to people, angels uh, rescue people physically. They, they also, uh, uh, you know, uh, disappear <laughs> apparently from, from our sight. So, to have, so part of me says, well, angels must have some aspect of corporality that, that I can't understand from the totality of, of my reading of the Bible yet. 
what, what's your comments on that? Yeah, and that's a good question. I don't think we're talking about that uh, in, in this lecture series. Now, I have given a lecture series, or, or it was a Wednesday night Bible study, actually, where I talked about this a little bit. Uh, but embodiment, when we talk about the supernatural, and even the word supernatural is, is tricky and maybe not the best way of, of characterizing these ancient ideas. Um, we often assume as Christians that angels don't have bodies, and they're called spirits. But in ancient Greek, also just in the ancient world, I don't think they were thinking of these beings as, as things that lacked uh, corporeal forms or, or lacked bodies, but it was a different sort of body. Right. So it's not fleshly bodies, it's a spiritual body. And it's, it's in the humans one day, according to, to Paul, will, will have sp uh, spiritual bodies. Whatever that is. What, whatever that is, right? right. It's, it's, it's different from what, uh, what we have now. Uh, yes, ma'am. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that I pretty much think everybody here has either a biblical belief or a doctrinal belief in the Bible. If you look at what happened in the days of Noah, they did not believe. Right? Oh, what's that? Then you look at the coming of Jesus, and they had a doctrinal biblical belief. They knew it was going down this way. And what happened with that? So now we're sitting here today in 2023 with our biblical doctrinal belief. What are we getting wrong? That's that's a very good point. So so for, for the folks on Zoom, uh, what this, this very intelligent young woman has said in the back of the room is that we are, uh, if we look throughout history, that we can see at different points in time in the Bible and, and otherwise that people have believed something very confidently to be true, and it turned out that they were wrong. And, and it would probably be very arrogant on our part to assume that we figured everything out and, and couldn't use a bit of, of correction. So keep that in mind, because everything I'm telling you is right. Uh, so, so, <laughs> it, that, that applies to me as well, right? This, that's, uh, this is a lifelong journey, and at the end of my life, I will have not, I will not have arrived at it, figuring this, this all out. There's another hand over here. Yes, ma'am. Let's say that um, the sons of God were angels who left their first estate, as it says. Okay, those angels, you've proven that are uh, in the Bible says they are bound until judgment. So are those different from what people believe are fallen angels, which left or got you know banished from heaven chose to leave and what they call demons now you're doing a beautiful job setting up, setting up the second half of the, <laughs> <laughs> the uh, that's what we're going to talk about is, is, is it time to transition it almost is isn't it? Not, okay stay tuned uh, we are going to talk about what in the world are demons what are evil spirits how do these relate to fallen angels are they all the same thing or are they different things? that's what we're doing after a break of the link so that that's different. Huh? we'll see <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Stokes. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. We will reconvene at 10 after 11. So if you need to use the restroom or get another cup of coffee, I believe they, they gave us some refills over there. So 11 to about 12 o'clock in order to go downstairs for a while. Come share with us again. Have I ruffled any feathers yet? <laughs> not too bad. Not too bad. All right. All right. Well, that's not my... <laughs> Do keep in mind that we're, that we're moving uh, chronologically. It is on. <laughs> so we're moving chronologically through these steps. So some of the things that you're thinking about right now, you know, why is he saying this or why is he saying that? It's because we haven't gotten to all of the passages in the New Testament yet. So some of the things that you're you're waiting for, wondering why I haven't mentioned them yet, is because we haven't gotten there yet, and and as we move chronologically through. Uh, the the ancient Israelite, the, the Hebrew text, early Jewish text, and, and the uh, text. The question that I'm going to ask today is, or for the second part of our time, is what are demons and what are evil spirits? Do we know where they came from or, or anything like that? And in short, the Bible really doesn't answer 
these questions. Uh, but what I want to do is look at what the Bible does say uh, in relation to these beings, uh, and then what early Jewish texts are, are saying as well. Now, I have a passage on my PowerPoint. I'm trying to decide at the last second here whether to, to go over it or whether to skip over it. <laughs> no, 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 I'm just trying to, I just wonder if it would be better to say it another time. Uh, I, I had it on my PowerPoint in case someone asked the question about it. Uh, and so we were talking about the fall of the angels. Well, let's do it. Let's wrap it up. <laughs> if you asked a, an early Jewish person or a New Testament author when the angels fell, they would probably point you to Genesis 6, the story that we were just reading. Uh, now, some of you may be wondering. What about Revelation 12? War broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought back, but they were defeated. And there was no longer any place for them in heaven. The great dragon was thrown down. That ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Now, isn't this story about the fall of the angels? Well, yes and no, it is about the defeat of Satan and certain angels being cast out of heaven with Satan. But this isn't the story. This isn't, if you like comic book, uh, if you follow the MCU or DCEU or any of, any of this, this is not the origin story of Satan. This is a story about the defeat of Satan, not where Satan came from. Uh, because if we read on in Revelation, because then I heard a loud voice in heaven proclaiming, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah, for the accuser of our comrades has been thrown down and accuses them day and night before our God, but they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they did not cling to life even in the face of death. So this passage here, now there's a lot that we don't know about this passage. It, it's, it's a tricky passage to interpret, but it does seem to be clear that this is not a story of Satan getting evicted from heaven set in the, the ancient past, back in the, the days of Genesis. This is a story of Satan's defeat that is credited to the blood of Christ and to the, <coughs> the testimony of Christians who are faithful to God and willing to suffer uh, for their faith. So this is a story about where Satan ends up, not where he came from, if that yeah. makes sense. Well, I'm not going to go into the millennium today, uh, but, but, uh, but that's one way of reading it, that's for sure. All right. Oh, and there's this picture here. Uh, if you've ever, this is not a photograph. Uh, <laughs> this, this, is, this is an artistic rendering. Uh, here you have Ah, uh, the character we, we meet in, in the book of Numbers uh, that Joshua and, and the Israelites defeat, but he, he's, he's said to be very, very large. He's riding a giant unicorn uh, that has <laughs> ropes tied to its horn by which he is pulling the ark. Uh, I don't know if Noah is pointing, saying, take me over there, or he's waving at him. Uh, Og kind of reminds me of the Jolly Green Giant, the way he's... <laughs> but, uh, but uh, anyway, this is just a fun picture. This brings nothing to our knowledge. <laughs> Here's our topic now. What exactly are demons uh, and evil spirits? The terminology is a little trickier than you uh, The word demon is actually a Greek word, so we don't see the word demon in the Old Testament. There is a word that is, or a couple of words that are frequently translated as demon power. So let's look at, at the words that we have in the Bible for demon. The main one, the one that's going to kind of get the most traction in early Judaism and uh, even in, in early Christianity, at least through translation, is the word shading. And we don't know exactly what this word means. The word only occurs twice in the Old Testament, so we don't have a lot to go on to figure out what the word means. But I'll come back to, to that in a moment. Uh, in Greek, we have the word di, uh, daimonia. We have this in the New Testament, also the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Uh, the word shading is translated daimonia. Uh, daimonia is the word where we get the word, or uh, is the, the Greek word uh, from which the word demon is derived. Yes, sir? How about the Septuagint? 
That's not done when he, uh, uh, the Septuagint, so the Septuagint is the Greek translation? Yes. So in the Septuagint, you have done when he is. Okay, but that's what they translate, uh, Shadim. That's right. So so where you have Shadim in Hebrew, the Greek translates that uh, done when Good. So the question is, is what word does the Septuagint word use? The Septuagint, meaning the, the Greek, the ancient Greek translation of the Old Testament that was originally written uh, in Hebrew. All right, another, uh, the terminology that we should be aware of uh, is evil spirit. Uh, in Hebrew, this is ruach ra. Now, this is not going to be on the quiz at the end of our time. Uh, so, so don't feel pressured to, to furiously write down the Hebrew and Greek words. Uh, the Greek, uh, in Greek translation, this is pneuma phoneiron. And those simply mean, there's nothing fancy about this. Ruach ra means evil spirit. Uh, Pila Poneron means evil spirit. So this is not one of those things where it's like, here's the Greek word, and it really means this, and all your translations are wrong. No, your translations are just fine. Um, uh, these are the expressions in Hebrew and Greek that refer to evil spirit. Now, we want to talk about what the word evil means in this context, because evil is a very ambiguous word. Uh, it has a wide range of meanings. So we'll, we'll come back uh, to the expression evil spirit. Let's start off with the shading. So uh, the shading are mentioned in just two texts. In all of the Old Testament, the first one is Deuteronomy chapter 33, verses 16 through 17. They made him jealous with strange gods, with abhorrent things they provoked him. They sacrificed to demons, not God, to deities they had never known, to new ones recently arrived whom your ancestors had not feared. So there we have Israel sacrificing to demons and angering God by, by worshiping. Uh, these demons. These demons are identified with gods of other nations or foreign gods, gods other than than uh, Yahweh, the God of Israel. Similarly, in Psalm 106, uh, referring to Israel, that they mingled with the nations and learned to do as they did. They served their idols, which became a snare to them. They sacrificed their sons and their daughters to demons. But these are the only two places in the Old Testament where Shadim. Now, there are other figures mentioned who, who could be demonic as well. We'll look at a couple of those. Uh, but, uh, but this is the only two places where you have the word shading, uh, which is going to be probably the more important one uh, moving forward in, in the tradition. Uh, let's move on for now to evil spirits. You really just get one passage, or I mean, depending on how you define a passage. So there's a, uh, the story of David and Saul is where you get an evil spirit. Uh, in uh, the Old Testament. It says, Now the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. And Saul's servant said to him, See now an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord now command uh, the servant to attend you, to look for someone who is skillful and playing the lyre. And when the evil spirit from God is upon you, he will play it, and you will feel better. And whoever, or, and whenever the evil spirit from God came upon Saul, David took the lyre and played it with his hand, and Saul would be relieved and feel better, and the evil spirit would depart from him. Now, this is really fascinating. You have an evil spirit uh, that said, that's said to be from the Lord, who's tormenting Saul, and David apparently is able to exercise the spirit, or at least provide Saul relief from the spirit by playing a musical instrument. So lots of really interesting things going on there. Uh, part of my research was looking at ancient Near Eastern texts, uh, Akkadian uh, writings or Babylonian writings, uh, and what they say about evil spirits. And, and there's some really fascinating stuff in there. Uh, but one of the ways that you can drive out an evil spirit is by banging a copper drum. So if you have a, ever had a child who's learning to play the drum set, you know uh, that, that certainly drives any sane being from the ring. Uh, but uh, banging a copper drum, these... Uh, these evil spirits, they were primarily blamed for physical uh, physical afflictions. Apparently, the Babylonians had lots of digestive issues because most of the demons that we read about are, are ones that are causing them, them problems. One of the demons is named Shulak of the Toilet, for instance. Uh, if you're looking for a username for your <laughs> Facebook page or something like that, uh, Shulak of the Toilet is a, is a great one. Um, but here we have an evil spirit that's troubling Saul. We don't know exactly what what the nature of the trouble is. We get a little bit of a clue. Um, 
in, in chapter 18, verse 10, it says, The next day an evil spirit from God rushed upon Saul, and he raved within his house while David was playing the lyre as he did day by day. Uh, so here it says that Saul raved. The word here is the same word that's used to prophesy. And Saul is doing what a prophet does when the spirit comes upon him. Um, and this seems to be some sort of an ecstatic thing. Maybe he, he falls over. We have another story where the spirit of God comes upon Saul, and he falls down and lies naked all day long. Uh, and people look at Saul naked and they say, oh, I didn't know Saul was a prophet. Uh, if you take a spiritual gift test and it says that your gift is prophecy, uh, be careful because you never know what that might require of you. But Saul, Saul uh, lay down naked and wasn't able to, to pursue David. So maybe he's doing something like that here. He's somehow incapacitated. Uh, and, and David's playing the lyre uh, provides some sort of relief for Saul. And this is actually a clue to what the word evil means in evil spirit. The word evil in this passage doesn't seem to suggest that the spirit is morally evil or in rebellion against God. Now, we'll get to that a little later. But evil could also mean harmful. Kind of like the word bad in English. Um, sin is bad, but but so was Carson Newman's loss uh, on the baseball field, let's say, uh, to Tuscal, I think. That was, that was At least it was bad, bad in, in Jefferson City. Uh, so the word bad can be used lots of different ways. And this, this is a bad spirit, or probably a spirit that's harmful. Uh, and that's what it's doing to Saul. It's, it's it's, it's not a spirit of sin. The spirit is actually from God, but it's harming Saul. And, and so that's what the expression evil spirit means in the Old Testament, at least. <coughs> Look at another uh, passage. Um, Isaiah 13, 19 through 22. This is talking about uh, the, the defeat and destruction of Babylon. In Babylon, the glory of the kingdoms of splendor and pride of the Chaldeans will be like Sodom and Gomorrah when God overthrew them. It will never be inhabited or lived in for all generations. Arabs will not pitch their tents there. Shepherds will not make their flocks lie down there, but wild animals will lie down there. And its houses will be full of howling creatures. Their ostriches will live. And their goat demons will dance. Hyenas will cry in its towers and jackals in the pleasant places. Its time is close at hand, and its days will not be prolonged. Now, the word here translated as goat demons, there is debate about it. It could be a goat demon, or it could just be goats. So how do you know if it's a goat demon or a goat? I don't, I don't know. Share, share the gospel with it and see if it <laughs> reacts on it. Does it smell, smell the goat, goat demon smell worse than regular goats? Or you think regular goats smell? Yeah. So, so it's just, when you have a list of animals in the old time, it's, it's hard to know. It's the same thing with plants. We just get these in lists, and we don't often have a lot of context for understanding what's going on. All of the other creatures in this passage do seem to be animals. So I kind of lean towards this not being a demon, but just some sort of goat-like creature. Uh, but uh, but it is translated as goat demon. So some of your translations, if you look up this passage, it'll translate this as demons or goat demons or something like that. Here's a similar passage also in Isaiah. Uh, but the hawk and the hedgehog shall possess it. The owl and the raven shall live in it. Thorns shall grow over its strongholds, nettles and thistles in its fortresses. It shall be the haunt of jackals and abode for ostriches. Wild cats shall meet with hyenas. Goat, there's a Kentucky joke in there somewhere, isn't there? <laughs> Goat demons shall call to each other. There too Lilith shall repose. Anyone heard of Lilith? Yes. This is a, a uh, someone asked me about gender uh, between our sessions. Here, here, Lilith comes to be regarded as a female demon in, in later Jewish tradition. Now, is that the Lilith we're talking about here, or is this just another animal? It's, it's hard to tell. Uh, I read some commentators who say this is just some sort of bird that makes noise at night, and I read other commentary, commentators who say that this is, uh, this is the demon, uh, Lilith in the Old Testament. There two wolves shall repose and find a rest. There shall the owl nest and lay and hatch and root in its shadow. There too the buzzard shall gather each one with its mate. Uh, one more passage from Leviticus. Uh, the priest shall dash, dash the blood against the altar of the Lord at the entrance of the tent meeting and turn the fat and the smoke as a pleasing odor to the Lord so that they may no longer offer their sacrifices for goat demons. So here you have worshiping goats or worshiping goat demons can they prostitute themselves uh this shall be a statute forever to them throughout their generation so the main things we have here are shading and 
the, the demons and the evil spirit. But we have some other figures. And there are others I can mention as well, potential demonic figures in the Old Testament. Some of this depends on how you define demon. And even the category of demon itself is later than the Old Testament because it's a Greek word. These are texts written uh, in Hebrew. So the category of demon, uh, you know, I don't know if it would have been current in Greek at the time the Old Testament was written or not, but it's, but we're taking a foreign category at least and bring it to the Old Testament. So it gets difficult answering the question, but we do have these other entities in the Old Testament. We have Shadim, who are the false gods worshipped by Israel, uh, but we also have uh, the evil spirit. Uh, who comes from God to harm Saul. And so that's what we have here. If we're going to define shading, what we have in the Old Testament, the shading are illegitimate, illegitimate gods or idols of the nations. And Israel will mistakenly worship these gods. An evil spirit uh, is an invisible being that harms humans. And that's about all we know about these beings in the Old Testament. It never tells us where they came from. It doesn't say why the evil spirit is working for God rather than, rather than something else. We don't, we don't get the idea of these beings being in rebellion against God yet. It's a little later in the literature that they finally start speaking of evil spirits and demons somehow working against God's purposes rather than serving God's purposes. Uh, but let's move on to the early Jewish literature. Uh, so what we see in the Old Testament, we have these Shadim, the false gods worshipped by other nations and occasionally by Israel. We have an evil spirit, someone who troubles human beings, physically afflicting human beings uh, on God's behalf. We also encounter demons and evil spirits in early Jewish literature. So you remember this story that we, we looked at in the previous hour? Uh, the book of Watchers, when the sons of men had multiplied in those days, beautiful and comely daughters were born to them, and the Watchers, the sons of heaven, saw them and desired them. And they said to one another, come, let us choose for ourselves wives from the daughters of men, and let us beget children for ourselves. These and all the others with them took them for themselves, or took for themselves wives from among them, such as they chose, and they began to go into them, and to defile themselves through them, and to teach them sorcery and charms, and to reveal to them the cutting roots of plants, and they conceived from them, and bore them great giants. Now these giants, let's talk about them. So looking ahead at 1 Enoch 15, the giants who were born to the, the hybrid marriages of the sons of God and the daughters of men. Says, but now the giants who were begotten by the spirits and flesh, they will call them evil spirits on the earth. For their dwelling will be on the earth. The spirits that have gone forth from the body of their flesh are evil spirits. For from humans they came into being, and from the holy watchers was their origin, uh, was the origin of their creation. Evil spirits, they will be on the earth, and evil spirits, they will be called the spirits of heaven, and heaven is their dwelling, but the spirits begotten on the earth, on the earth is their dwelling. So here, for the first time, in, in Judaism, at least, we have an explanation for where evil spirits come from. Now, I'm not endorsing this explanation. Again, this is, this is a text that's outside of uh, our canvas, it's not one of our scriptures. Uh, but we see that early Jews, uh, toward the end of the Old Testament period, between the Texas, are starting to think, where did these evil spirits come from? Uh, and their explanation is that, well, the, the sons of God, when they had children, the daughters of men, their children were gigantic, and their, their children were eventually killed. However, there is this spiritual remnant of these giants. The giants were killed, uh, their flesh was put to death. But spiritually, they live on in the form of these evil spirits. So where do evil spirits come from? They're the children of the sons of God and the daughters of men uh, from Genesis 6, or at least the spiritual remnant of them. Well, what do they do? That's where they came from. What do they do? And the spirits of the giants consume, do violence, make desolate, and attack and wrestle and hurl upon the earth and cause illnesses. And that sounds... A little bit like what we have in Saul's case, where he's harming Saul physically, but we're getting getting a, perhaps an expansion of what they're doing here in comparison with, with 1 Samuel uh, 16 and 18. They eat nothing. Remember that. We'll come back to that in a second. They, they don't eat, apparently. These Babylonian demons, often they wouldn't eat either. So if a, if a person's not eating, uh, that may be a symptom of demonic affliction. Um, they abstain from food and are thirsty and smite. These spirits will rise up against the sons of men and against the women, for they have come forth from them, 
From the day of the slaughter and destruction of the death of giants, from the soul of whose flesh the spirits are proceeding, they are making desolate without incurring judgment. Thus, they will desolate until the day of the consummation of the great judgment. So what are the evil spirits doing? They're going around making people all kinds of sick. They're making people sick in a lot of different ways, and they're going to do that until the judgment day. That's that's what First Enoch says, at least. Actually, there's another portion of First Enoch that adds just a bit more information. Notice that so far in the Old Testament and in early Judaism, we haven't seen evil spirits causing people to sin yet. They're not tempting people to sin. They're just harming people. But that changes at some point in the 3rd century B.C. or around there. Uh, Enoch is going on a tour of the world, going to all these great places, and one place that he goes is this incredible pit, and these pillars of fire in the pit, and, and the angel Uriel uh, tells Enoch, Here, here's what those pillars of fire are, and what that is. He said, there stand the angels who mingled with the women, and their spirits, having assumed many forms, bring destruction on men and lead them astray to sacrifice to demons as to gods until the day of the great judgment. So this is a really short passage, but there are a couple of really significant things going on here. Um, first of all, for the very first time in our literature, we have spirits that are said to cause people to sin. We don't have that before this point. Um, so one of the things that you'll see as we're, we are um, tracing the development of these documents or these, these ideas is that these beings that were harming people early on eventually come to do more than harm people. They're, they're eventually, they're also causing people to sin and then harming them. And so we have that with spirit here. They're not just harming people physically, but they're leading them to worship false gods. Notice also the relationship between spirits and demons. Now, how many of you would say a spirit and a demon are the same thing? You wouldn't be wrong if you did. That's, that's the way those words are used in English today. Spirits and demons are the same thing. Not in this text. In this text, a spirit is one thing and a demon is another. The spirits are the sons of these fallen angels that are causing people to worship demons. The demons are the ones being worshipped, and the spirits are the ones leading people astray. The demons probably here are those angels that fell. They're imprisoned, but these spirits are still out and about in the world leading people to worship them. So the demons are fallen angels, but they're not active in the world. It's the spirits who are active in the world, uh, according to this this text, and they're active, making people, uh, harming people, making them sick, uh, but also leading them to worship demons. In another text. Uh, this is the book of Jubilees. We looked at this one a little earlier as well. Checking the time, we're good. During the third week of this Jubilee, impure demons began uh, to mislead. No, oh, wait, sorry. How was that? <laughs> That wasn't just a Zoom thing. No one could see that. Uh, during the third week of this jubilee, impure demons began to mislead uh, Noah's grandchildren to make them act foolishly and to destroy them. And then Noah's sons came to their father and told him about the demons who were misleading, blind, or blinding, and killing his grandchildren. Now, this is a slight change here from what we have earlier. In the previous text, in the Old Testament and in the first Enoch, demons are being worshipped, but they're not really doing anything. Now we come to jubilees, and demons are also out and about harming people. And God, or Noah prays to God, and, uh, and Noah says, um, You, God, know how your watchers, the fathers of these spirits, have acted during my lifetime. As for these spirits who have remained alive, shut them up, hold them captive in a place uh, of judgment. There's a lot going on here. We'll look at this passage next time because Satan actually comes into the conversation in the next few verses. Uh, but we'll hold off on that. I guess the thing to note here is, although an evil spirit is one thing in the Old Testament and a demon is another thing, once we come to the book of Jubilees, people are starting to use demon and evil spirit interchangeably. A demon is the same thing as an evil spirit, and an evil spirit is the same thing as a demon. Uh, and we actually have this terminology in the Gospels as well, where a demon and an evil spirit are, are the same thing. In Luke 9, it talks about a spirit seeding. A young man, and all at once he shrieks, it convulses him until he foams the mouth and mauls him and will scarcely leave him. Uh, this this uh, father who's asking Jesus for help says, I begged your disciples to cast him out, but they could not. 
Jesus answered, you faithless and perverse generation, how much longer must I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon dashed him to the ground in convulsions. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. So here you have demon and evil spirit used interchangeably. So just to summarize in short, in the Old Testament, a demon is a god worshipped by the nations, or, or Israel. An evil spirit is somebody who harms people. But eventually, the terminology changes, and people are calling evil spirits demons. That they get lumped together. Now, is a demon and evil spirit the same thing? Um, well, it depends on who's talking. It depends on what kind of word you're using. I, I don't know. If I, I told my students the other day that if I, uh, if I use the word trunk, what am I talking about? I'm talking about the, the, the storage part of the back of your car or, or an elephant's nose, a tree trunk, a suitcase, something you might go swimming in, maybe not, not, not in January or February, but, but uh, yeah, so, so they can use the same words and mean different things. And so some people, they're, they're, when they say demon, they're talking about what another person would call a spirit. Uh, but in some cases, the author is distinguishing demons from spirits. This is an interesting story from Mark 3. Uh, then he went home, this is Jesus, he went home, and the crowd came together so that they could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying he's gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he has Beelzebul, and by the ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. But Jesus is casting out demons, and he's accused of being possessed by a demon himself. But why, why do you think that the, uh, the scribes got the idea to say that Jesus was possessed by a demon. He's not eating. He's so busy that he doesn't have time to eat. And so his family is concerned that something's wrong with him. Uh, and the scribes say, hey, this is our opportunity. Uh, he's doing all these, these really impressive things and, and we want to discredit them. Uh, so this is our opportunity to accuse him of, of being possessed by a demon. It's the fact that he's not eating, that they can say, look, he's not eating. I remember you referencing that earlier. What, what was that from earlier? The not eating? That was first Enoch talked about that. Also, some uh, Babylonian texts do that as well. Demons and evil spirits throughout most of the New Testament are probably interchangeable. The terminology they're talking about the same thing, but we do have some instances in the Bible where it seems to be talking about one and not the other. Uh, in 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul talks about people who worship uh, food sacrifice to idols uh, and, and, and people who are not Christian or Jewish. Uh, they're worshiping their own deities, and, and Paul says that these deities are demons, not God. And so this is kind of like what we have in the Old Testament, where people are worshiping demons, not worshiping uh, God. Uh, Paul never says, or the New Testament never says, that anyone is worshiping an evil spirit. You don't worship evil spirit, you worship demons. So that's why you have the word demons here. Uh, let's see, one other passage here that's, that's interesting. In 1 Timothy 4, 1, now the Spirit expressly says that in later times, some will renounce the faith by paying attention to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Now, most commentators say that these are, this is kind of two ways of referring to the same thing. Uh, deceitful spirits and teachings of demons are both the same thing. But what I've argued is maybe um, these are actually two different things. Uh, spirits are out and about deceiving people. The demons are in prison, but they're the ones who taught sorcery and divination and, and these other sorts of things. Their teachings, although the demons themselves are in prison, their, their teachings are still out and about. Uh, and, and so... Uh, I wonder if in 1 Timothy 4, this is having the same sort of distinction that we find in, let's say, 1 Enoch, where you have evil spirits who are leading people astray, but demons who, who gave humankind these various teachings. They're not currently active, but their teachings are still, still very, very present. So this may be a bit, this is probably different from what you expect. I'll say, what's a demon, what's an evil spirit? The Bible doesn't tell us where they came from. Uh, it never gives us a definition. It never explains to us what their essence is. Um, some authors we looked at said a demon is one thing and a, an evil spirit is another thing. Uh, maybe a demon is a fallen angel, but the spirit is the children, or the, a spirit is a child of a fallen angel. Uh, but then other people, when they use the words demon and evil spirit, they're talking about the same thing. They're, they're lumping them 
them together. So when you're reading a text and it talks about a demon or an evil spirit, be careful not to assume that you understand what it what it means because they may be using these same words in, in different ways. That makes sense. Relatively, it makes as much sense as the other stuff I've said today. <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, it's like a right. so, so why is the book of Enoch not in the Bible? Uh, Enoch was one of those books that some early Jews and early Christians found really helpful and others did not. And so explaining it historically is, is more people found other books to be significantly more helpful and not as many people found the first Enoch to be helpful and so it wasn't included in the canon. Yeah, it would be like a nice commentary on the on the Bible. It's, it's, a, it's a good thing to read. You can learn from it, but it's not the word of God. It's probably the way a lot of people regard it. All right. I think we have time for a few questions. <laughs> yes. Um, my wife and I had the experience of being in the midst of this in 1969. We went to the island of Dutch New Guinea, uh, which is called West Papua now, as missionaries. And our assignment was to go into an unreached tribe of people. And they, their total worship was evil spirits, demons. Uh, I, I, see, uh, I see people uh, have a curse put on them, and the next day they're dead. They would cannibalize their enemies. They have a and, and if they shot somebody, they would eat the body in order to render that spirit harm, harmless to them. That was their theory. And and then another thing that happened to us, I I, I would find some artifacts, you know, to bring back to America to show people, you know, what the, the, how primitive it was. And and one night, my daughter, three years old, started screaming at night and and stammering. And we said, what in the world is going on? And I prayed to God and he showed me that some of the things I had bought had been prayed over by the, by the witch doctors. So I took them outside, burned them, and she healed like that. And, and the people said, once we got, you know, we had to translate scripture into their language, give them the gospel message. And, what, and then they finally said, we cannot accept God and the Bible until we burn our fetishes. And so they built a big bonfire and burned their fetishes. And then when we left, the difference in their, they, they didn't even have a word for love. Now they, the, their countenance has changed because they accepted Jesus Christ as their personal savior. And it's amazing the transformation in their life. So we, we saw firsthand, you know, the activity of demonic influence. Thank you so much for sharing that. I have not witnessed that myself, uh, but but I, I've heard a lot of people who have, and, and very, very good people whom I trust uh, who shared stories like that with me. So thank you for sharing that with us. Yes, sir. You were talking about there for in this reference, something that teaches demons and they be wrong fit. In Mark 16 and Matthew 10, both Jesus tells them as they go to cast out devils. The same three words, two names. So they keep me watching these cases. Oh, right. In that case, so you, you, you mentioned a couple of passages where, where Jesus or his followers were casting out demons. In that case, I would say that they're using the word demon interchangeably with evil spirit. Uh, and so, so there are demons that are out and about doing, doing mischief, uh, use a light word, I guess. Um, however, sometimes when they refer to demons, they're referring to, to beings that are in prison, not beings that are currently out and about. So in those, those passages, it's using the word demon to refer to what another author might call an evil spirit. Yeah. Huh? It's a trunk, it's a trunk, that's right. What else might? Should I ask you a question? 
<laughs> you're going to get into Ephesians 6 at all? Oh, yeah, maybe, maybe on in two weeks we will. That's okay. a fun one. That's a fun one. Okay. Um, yeah, the uh, th there is a passage. These demons who are going to who are out of out doing all these bad things, the, the evil spirits, until the day of judgment. You have this interesting uh passage in uh the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, where, where Jesus uh encounters the, the garrison demoniac. He's the one who says that. that Jesus asks his name and says, many, for we are legion, for we are many. Uh, but one of the things that the demon says to Jesus is, have you come here to torment us before our time? And so, so these evil spirits are expecting their judgment to come one day, kind of like some of these texts have, have suggested. It. And, and they're, they're, they, they encounter the Son of God, the Messiah here, and they think, oh, is this it? Or, or do we have a little longer left? Or, you know, they're, they're, they're not excited to see Jesus. Um, interesting, in the Gospel of Mark, uh, the very first people to recognize that Jesus is the Messiah are demons. Not, not Jesus' disciples, not any of the people he's teaching, but demons are the first ones to say, hey, we know who you are, you're the son of God, and Jesus tells them to be quiet because he doesn't want word to get out uh, at that time. Yes? I guess the modern day <coughs> mentality doesn't like to do this, what you do. They kind of reject demons. Mm -hmm. So how do you explain what word to use, the existence of, or the perception of? How do you do so, Did you get that? I didn't quite get the, the question. I heard you say that. So how do you explain the existence of and perception of, you got an ancient text, you got a modern yeah. situation. How do you, do you or do you? So I started asking, do I believe in demons? Not exactly. How do you explain uh, what the modern day says versus what you're saying, or do you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's a, a, a question I, I wrestle with. What you've asked is, in, in the ancient world, you have, um, they, they didn't know about bacteria and viruses and, and other sorts of microorganisms that, that were so small that they were invisible. And, and so they had to explain why are they seeing some people get sick and some people not get sick. There, there's nothing that's visible that explains this. And so evil spirits would be a great way to explain that. In our own day, we're aware of microorganisms and other sorts of uh, pathogens and allergens and, and these sorts of things that explain uh, some of the symptoms that we see. And so one question is, well, do we need demons anymore uh, to explain these sorts of things? <laughs> this may be overly simplistic for some of you. I'm not sure what the makeup of the room is. You know, I, I don't see a demon behind every corner. Like I, if a friend of mine gets sick, I have a headache, I take a Tylenol. Uh, I, I, maybe I should pray over it first, but I have to get time off. But however, I, I do believe that the Bible will talk about the existence of these figures, and I, I think that they do exist. Uh, now, how do I diagnose it? That's a different question. Like, how, you know, if, if someone is sick, how do you, or someone has some sort of, um, uh, you know, emotional issue, is this spiritual influence or is it explained biologically? And, and we would need some experts and professionals to, to do that for me. I'm not confident to do that. But, but I do believe that there are supernatural things that we can't see. It makes sense of the evil of the world to me. Of course, my own heart explains a lot of the evil, uh, because I don't know how simple I am, but I also believe there are these other entities out there who are personal evil. Yeah, I think you're not I think it does. I think uh, the idea that you have uh, these sons of God that we talked about, uh, these divine beings who seem to have some sort of authority and are receiving worship, I think that may relate to the powers and principalities that we encounter in a couple of New Testament passages. But those are tricky. The powers and principalities, those, those passages are, are debated. Yes, ma'am. In the passage that talks about jackals and hyenas and all these evil. They have a team for ostriches. <laughs> That's a great question. What else do they do? They're big birds. I've never thought of an ostrich. I, I, I think the point, it could be that they're, they're unclean, but also it's just when Babylon is destroyed, people aren't going to live there anymore. It's going to be overrun with animals. I think that may be the main point. Uh, but also, unclean animals would add insult to injury, perhaps. Uh, but uh, but I think that I don't think I have anything against ostriches specifically. It's just that you don't want them in your house. You'd rather live there yourself. <laughs> I guess maybe the force fire. I haven't thought of the force fire and maybe. All right. Well, I think we have time for one last question. Yes. A lady to lunch question: Do demons live in animals long? 
I don't, that's a great question. We do have one place where a demon goes into the animal is at the pigs, right? And then the pigs commit suicide, right? <laughs> so, uh, so I, yeah, I don't know. That, I, I guess I don't have enough information to answer the question. How long do demons stay in animals? <laughs> All right. All right. I, I don't know he wasn't, but I appreciate it. Thanks for the setup. <laughs> um, so, so you need to eat lunch uh, because you don't want people thinking you're demon possessed. Okay? <laughs> Thank you, Doctor.